Hey guys, welcome to the channel and another video. Today I'm going to be watching Angel Heart by Alan Parker. This is a film that I've never seen or heard of before. In fact, the only other film I've seen by Alan Parker is Pink Floyd The Wall, which was amazing. Uh, from the comments and looking up the poster, I know it stars Mickey Rourke and Robert De Niro, both high tier actors who need no introduction whatsoever. All I expect uh, is some sort of a horror or thriller film in this. So that's all. Uh, to help support the channel, I have a Patreon page for full length reactions, early access and weekly polls for what to watch next. You'll need your own copy of the film to watch along of course. Please consider being a Patron, please subscribe to the channel, do check out my other videos, like if you liked this video, dislike it if you didn't. With all that being said, let's get started. Angel Heart, Parker, Rourke, De Niro, let's go. Angel Heart. Special appearance by De Niro? Oh, okay, he doesn't have a starring role then. Oh, Lisa Bonnet! That's Lenny Kravitz's ex-wife and Zoe Kravitz's mother. I really like the cinematography in the beginning. And the music as well, it has a very neo-noir feel. Okay. And unlike previous films I've watched on the channel, this has a long drawn-out intro. And it's set in 1955. Rourke looks so young and he doesn't have so much surgery on his face like he does now. Safe year. Uh huh. Okay. No, I know the place. He's looking for somebody called Louis Cypher. Again, the camera work and the framing here is very good. I want you to show right now how much you love God. Where would religion be without donations? Would you come with me, please? An unfortunate husband of one of Pastor John's flock took a gun to his head. Hiya, uh, Harry Angel. De Niro. I assume he's the cypher person. Do you by chance remember the name Johnny Favorite? Am I supposed to know him? Uh, Monsieur Cypher has a contract. Well, Johnny wasn't so lucky. He returned home a virtual zombie that my interest in Johnny is only in finding out if he's alive or if he's dead. Okay, that's a lot of exposition. It's funny, I have a feeling I've met you before. I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> Even with that smile, he has a very intimidating presence. What's the name of the patient? Liebling. Jonathan Liebling. Is this recent? It's an old file. This here, uh, Dr. Fowler. Johnny favorites out of the hospital. Angel suspects that there's some foul play involved due to the ballpoint pen being used. That is a lot of morphine. Okay, this must be the doctor who transferred favorite. This film has very odd names like favorite, angel, a time for evening fix, and cipher. Information about Johnny Liebling. I see the works cooking upstairs, pal, and it ain't Mr. Salt's vaccine, yeah? I remember he was in the container <laughs> during the war. That straightened him up real fast. Some, some people came one night many years ago. He got in the car with them and drove away. I, I never saw him again. What was the deal? $25,000. I have no idea what he looked like. His face was damaged. I'm really ex enjoying this exchange of dialogue. It's well, very well written and very well shot, too. Go wild. Maybe when I get back, I'll fix you some goodies from the icebox, all right? Mickey Rourke can be intimidating too if he wants. The music has me a little nervous. Just straight up beats. Almost like a heartbeat. The camera work is very, very, very good. Parker really knows how to focus on the details. It was a locked door was shot through the eye. He definitely did not kill himself. This is the third time we're seeing a mirror. I wonder if there's any significance of that. Oh, he might have killed himself actually because we didn't see the bullets before and he's removing evidence that he was there in the first place. Again, the air pressure change. This is the second time this showed us that. Why would Parker do that? Did you see him? No. 
He took off for some guy called Kelly and a girl. De Niro's performance is so mesmerizing. Did you kill him? No, I didn't kill him. Are you afraid? He should be. Five thousand? Five thousand. Would you like an egg? No, thank you. I got a thing about chickens. A small thing showed Angel is superstitious. That was a great scene, once again. I'm pretty intrigued as to what will happen next, but I think Parker is taking his time. The music is also minimal and very unsettling. Some sort of satanic ritual? Voodoo dolls? Upside down crosses? Yeah, it has to be a satanic ritual of sorts. I don't know what to think of it yet, but they definitely have symbolism. Cypher, which um, Robert De Niro's character is. He's pretty much a cypher. We don't know anything about him. Kind of looks like it might be members of the church, but I'm not sure. Oh, man. It's after 11, Harry. You're late. Johnny Favorite was a crooner, like you said. So it's an informant who he has a personal relationship with. Nudity in this film kind of makes sense because it's moving the plot forward with exposition. Are you okay? That was a flashback to his war, post-war days, I'm guessing. Beautiful shot. Alan Parker was using the rule of thirds in that frame. The third time a fan has been shown and that was a really good transition. Johnny had a secret love. Black lady called Evangeline Proudfoot. Proudfoot. Coney Island is unusually empty. I'm looking for a Madame Zora. Fucking witch. Her and her wife got along real well. Have a nose shield. Go on, take one. I've never seen a nose shield before. Ask the wife, she'll know. She's always singing stupid tunes off the radio. She knows all that kind of shit. That's a beautiful shot. Very good cinematography so far, especially the dark scenes and the wide ones too. I was inquiring about a Madame Zora. She was messing with Morton Reed and Tea Leaf. Did you ever see her with a guy called Johnny Favorite? Yeah, he was cute. Used to visit her all the time. She was real stuck on him. Madame Zora was Margaret Cruzmark. Okay. Do you have any idea where I could find Johnny Favorite? No. Nope. I'm gonna meet her where I'm going. In Brooklyn? Ah, oh, Louisiana. Nice. And now we have 50s music. Wow, that's a huge contrast to what we saw in New York. The South looks completely different. Uh, this is Louisiana, right? The US is a very diverse country with so many different cultures and stuff. So you can visit one part and have a totally ex different experience to the other side. Well, you know, I had a bad line. I didn't know if it was... Uh... So he set up an appointment with her. Now, I'm gonna need your exact date of birth. February 14. It's Valentine's Day. I used to know a boy who was born on that exact same date. Uh huh. Really? I'm getting a little uneasy. There have been a lot of clues, and I don't know how I'm supposed to put them together. He was at the war. He sings. At least can hold a tune. The birthday sounds familiar. I think Parker is giving us clues. I'm just the guy who was paid to snoop around. Johnny has no future. He's dead. Pretty necklace you got there. Is she into like devil worshipping or something similar? Because we have been given some clues to that earlier in the film. There might be some supernatural elements to this film, which Parker is repeatedly giving us clues to. Smooth jazz, saxophones. I really love those instruments. Oh, she actually is dead. I think that's Lisa Bonnet. Holy crap, she looks so young here. I don't think I've seen her in any films before. I just know her as Zoe Kravitz's mother and... Lenny Kravitz, his ex-wife. So it's, uh... Epiphany. 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 Another odd name. I met all Mama's friends and never met anyone called Favorite. How about a guy named, uh, Toot Sweet? He was a friend of Favorite. Supposed to be a pretty good guitar player. I'm just being paid to find out where he is. At least being honest. He could be six feet under. There's a huge shift in cinematography between Louisiana and New York. Parker is using more open shots in Louisiana compared to New York. The editing in this film is also very cohesive. But I think the storytelling itself is a little bit muddled and um, fractured. And it might be on purpose. I don't think he likes a straightforward narrative. Well, you and him was buddies, weren't you? 
No, he made a record of one of my songs, but that don't make his buddy. Say, are you a dick or book writer? He didn't get much information from Favorite's old bandmate, Chickenfoot. Is that an omen of some sort? What's going on, Toots? Nothing. Mind your own business. Camel cigarettes were very popular back in the day. Don't be ashamed to call it. We're halfway through the movie and we have no idea who Johnny Favorite is or any clues to his whereabouts, except that he might be dead. So it's some sort of ritual. We're shown the fan again. What's this fucking star you are in your mouth? I'll tell you it's what. It's a pentagram, just like that palm reader. And the fan stopped when he left. This is like the third or fourth time when, when, when he leaves a room, either the direction of the fan changes or the fan just outright stops. That's, that's definitely on purpose and I'm convinced now. And the music is ramping up and it's a mix between jazz and almost ambient horror. And the beat we heard earlier is almost returning as well, like a heartbeat. Dude, just approach her from the front. That was a dream? Touch sweet is dead. Yeah. What? Touch sweet. Somebody cut his dick off, stuffed in his mouth, and choked Damn. him. Damn. I don't know, guys. I'm slowly getting a little suspicious of Angel. Every time he leaves the scene, the fan stops or somebody gets killed. I hate to make predictions, but I think I have an idea of what's going on. I'll, I'll let the movie play out and see whether that's right or wrong. Rourke's performance has been pretty good so far. And this, this, this kiss is a reference to a famous picture that was taken after the war in New York City. I didn't catch the glimpse of the guy in the flashback. Yeah, the camera work is top notch. Whoa, it's that palm reading fortune teller lady. She's also dead. Everybody Angel has visited, almost everyone is dead except for probably Epiphany. And she's been killed by the same knife that Angel was holding. He's removing evidence again, even though he wasn't involved in this crime according to him. But I think he, he might be, or he was. <laughs> Another shot of a fan. This is like the sixth or seventh time I've mentioned it. He's repeatedly framed with it. You look good, mister. The lighting of this shot is very good. We're officially in the third act of the film, I think, after the revelation that Epiphany's father was Johnny Favorite. I'm a murder suspect already in two cases. Just Johnny Favorite and the debt that's owed to me, Mr. Angel. But if I ain't careful, that 5,000 bucks you gave me could just buy me a seat on the electric chair. That was a really good exchange of dialogue. De Niro has only been in this film for less than 10 minutes and uh, I can clearly see his influence on the entire story. I think he's setting, I'm pretty sure he's setting Angel up. Come on. Come on inside. Uh, she once said that um, Johnny Favorite was as close to true evil as she ever wanted to come. What else did she say? He was a terrific lover. So where'd the father go? I never knew him. And the spirits possess you. It's called Chevalier. Oh, yeah. I'm familiar with that. Chevalier. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting a little uncomfortable here because my prediction directly is contradicting with the story now. I think Angel and Favorite are the same person because there, there are too many similarities between their stories, just like Fight Club. But this is getting really uncomfortable because if, if they're the same person, that's his daughter. That's his 17-year-old daughter. But it, I, I might be wrong, but it's not making me any less comfortable. There are just way too many clues that they're the same person. Oh no. 
It's gonna be really messed up if, if it's if, if it's revealed to be true. They both have the scars. They both were in the war. Angel can hold a tune. Somehow people get murdered when he leaves. There's blood falling from the ceiling. I think I just might be right. It's almost like he can't look at himself in a mirror on a subconscious level. I think I'm right, guys, and I think that was very messed up. She was into stargazing, black magic, all kinds of shit. There ain't nothing worse for a cop than people who get killed for nuts or reasons. Yeah, since nobody has been revealed at all to be Johnny Favorite, somebody who we already know must be him, and Angel has to be him. Way too many things. And I feel like he's remembering stuff in those flashbacks. What do you want, Mr. Angel? I guess you already knew that. Hey, 12 years ago, you and your daughter snatched favorite out of some nut hatch up in Poughkeepsie. It's a pity about your stomach. You'd have enjoyed our gumbo. I've never had gumbo before. Okay, if my predictions are correct, after this interaction with Mr. Kelly, he's somehow going to die. And if that's true, then Angel and Favorite are the same person. I did it for my daughter. Margaret wasn't evil. He made a pact with Satan. He sold his... I knew it. There, there are supernatural elements to this. Johnny sold his soul. He needed a victim. Someone his own age. Why? To steal their soul. And he sliced the boy clean open and he ate his heart. And then Johnny was injured, was sent home without even knowing Holy who he was. Holy crap. Who is the boy? It was Margaret's plan to drop him off in Times Square. That would be the last place that he'd remember before it happened. And the flashback we get to see is right in Times Square. He's reacting so emotionally. Because he's starting to remember. Oh man, he's dead. I wonder if Parker did that for shock value or Angel's character would just do that. And the music is ramping up as he's looking for the dog tag. The music just cut out. <laughs> Cypher's here. And I think I know who he, who he is too. Louis Cypher. Lucifer. <laughs> you think he's gonna scare me? And you killed him. You murdered them people. I never killed nobody. But he did. And borrowed time and another man's memories. He took that soldier's soul. And yours belongs to me. Oh. I know who I am. Fantastic scene and acting by both factors and that's why he couldn't look himself in the mirror earlier damn that's a great reveal and i really appreciate the fact that there were clues for the observing people to figure figure it out themselves and he's gone that wasn't a woman after all huh damn why'd you come back she's my daughter bullshit don't bring the child next to the dead mother that's his grandson, technically. You gotta burn for this, Angel. I know. What? That was the end. But we're still being shown, and we're still hearing the helicopter go down and down. Almost as if, as if he's going to hell. Or going down towards hell. I think that's it. But the sound is still playing. I really like that movie, guys. And it's still going down. I really enjoyed this one. Okay, so I took some time to collect my thoughts. First off, I really enjoyed the film. It was a neo-noir-influenced psychological thriller with a surprise and somewhat unexpected supernatural twist. Alan Parker used a non-traditional narrative structure for his film, where the detective is unaware that he's tracking himself. This is not a new trope by any means, but Parker manages to elevate it with its supernatural elements and the performance of his actors, especially Mickey Rourke. The story starts off by Parker introducing us to Harry Angel, a depressed and broken private detective who is sent to find a missing jazz singer, Johnny Favorite, by a mysterious Louis Cipher, played by Robert De Niro. Although the setup is familiar, uh, a few things set it apart from being an average film, like the subtle humor, a good mix of music genres, and the sudden twist into the supernatural. Let's start with the screenplay and directing by Alan Parker. 
Although it was based on a novel I haven't read by William Hertzberg, I believe this film was definitely in Parker's style, judging his work on Pink Floyd, The Wall. As I mentioned before, Angel was already a broken and unkempt man uh, when he was introduced, and when he and we see his mind slowly spiraling even more out of control by the end. In fact, by the end, I wouldn't even call him a man. He was mostly a shell of one. On the other hand, Cypher was cool, calm, and collected, and not even for one scene he was shown to raise his voice or show displeasure. It was almost as if Angel was fighting an uh, already lost fight. Parker also took a lot of time giving us expo exposition in the first two acts as he slowly revealed who Angel actually was. Um, even though Johnny Favorite was not shown till the last 15 minutes of the film, he was the driving force behind the plot. I really enjoyed the fact that Parker used Angel's point of view to relate to the audience. Basically, we learned the story through Angel's excellent detective work as he followed the clues to solve the case. Speaking of clues, uh, just like the usual suspects in Fight Club, um, Parker littered his films with uh, littered his film with subtle clues to favorites' true identity for the observant viewers. Um, it's all laid out there if you know where to look. I bet a second viewing would reveal even more clues I might have missed the first time around. There was a lot of symbolism used in the film, uh, like the changes in air pressure of the rooms shown shown by the direction of the fans uh, change when Angel leaves a room. I still don't believe I, am, I, I completely understand the meaning behind that. The blood, uh, blood was also used in a very similar manner during the rituals and the incest scene, which I found to be grotesque. Um, I wonder what narrative purpose uh, that scene had. Uh, maybe it was a way to show Angel's further fall into descent. I'm not outright complaining though, because it had quite a shock value and was probably devastating for Angel's character um, as he finally realized what he did, what he's done. All in all, great job directing. The cinematography and editing of the film were some of the strong points too. Uh, the cinematography was reverse, uh, reserved and um, it was the perfect tone for a neo-noir inspired detective film. It changed with the changing location, which I really appreciated. The scenes in New York felt more claustrophobic than the scenes in Louisiana. Uh, which were more open and colorful by contrast. The film palette used was also very contrasty as well, uh, with blood playing off the darker scenes of the film. The editing uh, has been nothing to complain about too. The shots were static most of the time, so were the transitions. One transition that caught my eye was the one where um, a scene seamlessly transitions from an exhaust fan to a tape recorder um, by Angel. This was very well done. The editing gets slightly more jarred and rough towards the end as the twists come in. Um, this was a deliberate and great choice to convey the mental state of Angel's character. The music in the film was varied and uh, very appropriate, from classic jazz standards all the way to traditional thriller and horror music. It was an odd mix to say the least, and it worked surprisingly well for the film. I'll be watching this film for sure, and I'll put more focus on concentrating on the music the second time around. From my initial viewing though, I really enjoyed it. Mickey Rourke played Harry Angel, or Johnny Favorite, uh, the supposed protagonist of the film. His performance was excellent, as Rourke can play a broken man to perfection. His, his character was similar in some ways to another role he played in 2008's The Wrestler which itself was a great film. Both characters were depressed, broken men who were consciously or subconsciously looking for redemption. Uh, Rourke's acting in the third act was sublime as he started recalling the horrible things he did, in, which included rape, murder, and the stealing of the soul of a soldier to go back on his deal with Lucifer. Speaking of Lucifer, Bob De Niro played uh, Louis Cipher, a metaphor for the big man himself. De Niro played Cypher with confidence and almost a, uh, with almost an arrogant demeanor. Uh, like I mentioned before, he was not in danger or intimidated even for a second. 
small details like his long nails and slick hairdo really help sell his role. I don't really have anything to say about uh, his performance though. He was amazing and convincing as Lucifer, even though he had a smaller role in the film, almost like a cameo. Lisa Bonnet played Epiphany Proudfoot, the daughter of a woman Angel had an affair with back in the day. Uh, her role was also limited, only providing exposition and clues to who Favorite truly was. Uh, obviously, she didn't know that she was having intimate relations with her own father, and I still don't think I understand that scene very well. Um, and I also don't understand why Favorite ended up killing uh, Epiphany. Regardless, she was pivotal to the film and her acting was pretty good too. It was a pretty, pretty well-made film and I don't have any outright criticisms. Uh, maybe if De Niro had a larger role or maybe reducing the second act by five minutes would have helped. I really can't come to a proper conclusion on this since I believe this film needs multiple viewings to get all the cogs in the story, uh, the cogs that bind the story together. Apart from that, this was a great psychological thriller and neo-noir inspired detective story. It really asked the audience to pay attention and to play detectives themselves. Very highly recommended. Anyways, thank you for watching. I have a Patreon page, consider being a patron. Subscribe to the channel, like if you like this video, dislike it if you didn't. I will see you in the next one. Bye.